स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's now discuss a few problems. The first problem is the following. Problem session. Problem one. Let n be greater than one, be a positive integer, and suppose c zero. Greater than c one, greater than up to c n, which are all positive numbers, positive real numbers, be real numbers, and let p of z be defined to be c zero plus c one z plus c n z to the power n. So we have a polynomial with L coefficients. The coefficients are special; they satisfy the condition that c zero is greater than c one is greater than c two, so on up to c n, all of which are positive real numbers. Then prove that there does not exist a root of p whose absolute value does not exceed 1 let's think about what the problem says let's uh, revisit the statement and see what it says so it says that if there is a root It it does not have basically a root whose absolute value does not exceed one. What is the meaning of absolute value does not exceed one? Basically, absolute value is less than or equal to one. This this is what it cannot have. It does not have root which has absolute value less than or equal to one, which means that absolute value should always be greater than one. So, rephrasing it, let me write down a solution. What do we want to show? Let me write it down in words. We Want to show that if p of z zero is equal to zero for some z zero in C, then mod z zero is greater than one. This is precisely what we want to show. If you think about what the statement says, we want to show that there does not exist a root. Such that the absolute value is less than or equal to. If at all there is a root, it has to be greater than one in absolute value. All right, let's solve the problem. In order to do that, let's consider uh, the polynomial which is given by one minus z times p of z. The reason why this is being considered is to use the hypothesis which is given here, which I am underlining in green. We are given that. the coefficients satisfy a nice condition and because of that we will be able to write this as being equal to p of z is basically c0 plus c1z plus up to cnz to the power n minus z times p of z which is c0 times z up to cnz to the power n plus 1 if i have to rewrite this this will just be equal to C zero uh, plus C one minus C zero times Z plus C n minus one C n minus C n minus one times Z to the power n minus C n Z to the power n plus one. Let's just rewrite it a bit. We will be able to write this as C zero minus a polynomial of this type. C zero minus C one times Z plus C n minus one minus C n times Z 
plus C n times z to the power n plus 1. The reason why we uh, rewrote uh, the polynomial in this manner is because all these coefficients now are positive numbers. Okay, now let's consider a root. Let z0 be a complex number such that p of z0 is equal to 0. That would imply that for z0, 1 minus z0 times p of z0 is 0 and therefore c0 will just turn out to be equal to c0 minus c1 times z plus c n minus 1 minus c n times or z0 times z0 or z0 plus to the power n and finally c n into z0 to the power n plus 1. This is precisely what will happen at uh, a root of the polynomial p. And if you are going to take the absolute value of this, it will be like this and so this is basically absolute value of z0 times the absolute value of c0 minus c1 plus cn minus 1 minus cn times z to the power n plus cn z minus 1 and finally it will be like this absolute value of this. This is precisely what happens when you uh, look at the absolute value of the product of two complex numbers. Remember that z0 is a complex number, so the thing on the right is now a complex number. You can take z0 uh, common factor and this is precisely what it turns out. And by, uh, by the triangle inequality, we will be able to write this as absolute value of c0 minus c1 plus absolute value of c2 minus c1 times the absolute value of z0 or maybe I should as of now just write it like this plus the absolute value of all these terms individually cn minus 1 minus cn times z to the power n minus 1 plus absolute value of cn z to the power n z0 to the power n which in particular is less than or equal to absolute value of z0 into c0 minus c1 is just a positive number. So, the absolute value will be the same plus again similarly c2 minus c1 is a positive number. We are now using the hypothesis of uh, the statement which will be giving us something like this. Finally, cn minus 1 minus cn times mod or absolute value of z0 to the power n minus 1 plus cn times the absolute value of z0 to the power n. So, till now we have not assumed anything about how the root should behave. Now, let us try to prove that z0 cannot be in the closed unit disk. So, if mod z0 is less than or equal to 1, let us see what happens. Then, let me just directly write this as this is less than or equal to c0 minus c1 plus c2 minus c1 plus cn minus 1 minus cn plus cn. This is precisely what will happen if mod the absolute value of z0 is less than or equal to 1. And this telescopic sum will just be equal to c0. But if you carefully observe here, we started off with absolute value of c0. Remember that c0 is a, a positive number. Let me write it here. c0 is the same as the absolute value of c0 because it is a positive number. So, we have now a c0 here and a c0 less than or equal to at the bottom. And uh, we know that it is equal and therefore, all these inequalities which I am now indicating they are all equal because at the bottom it is equal. If one of them was a strict inequality, the last one would have also been a strict inequality. So, all these are uh, equal and I am very interested in the equality which comes in what is being taken in box. So, let us focus on that. Let me rewrite that below. Since the 
last inequality is an equality all the inequalities above are also equalities therefore we have let me just show you once more what was put in the box the the first two of them will will be equal so let's write that down absolute value of z not times the absolute value of c not minus c1 times uh, oh, the Z0 has been already taken care of. C2 minus C1 times Z0 plus up to Cn minus 1 minus Cn times Z0 to the power n minus 1 plus Cn Z0 to the power n. This is equal to the absolute value of Z0 times C0 minus C1 plus the absolute value of C2 minus C1 times Z0 plus absolute value of Cn minus 1 minus Cn times Z0 to the power n minus 1 plus Cn Z0 to the power n. Notice that Z0 can never be 0. If Z0 is 0, then P of Z0 is equal to 0 would imply that C0 is equal to 0, a contradiction. So, Z0 can never be equal to 0 because we have assumed all the coefficients to be positive. In fact, C0 is the largest coefficient. And because of that, we can cancel the absolute value of Z0 because it is not 0. And what we end up is an equality in this triangle inequality. So we have hence absolute value of C0 minus C1 plus absolute plus, yeah, so I, I don't know whether I should be writing it down again. It's just, okay, no problem. This is Cn minus 1 minus Cn times Z0 to the power n minus 1 plus Cn Z0 to the power n. This is equal to the absolute value of each of these terms separately. And so on, let me not fill it up. And at this point, let me recall something from your uh, course on linear algebra, which says that prove using Cauchy Schwarz that if mod of a plus b is equal to mod of a plus mod of b, then a is equal to lambda times b for lambda in R. It's actually a straightforward check. You should uh, sit down and uh, prove it using Cauchy Schwarz. Remember that we are now in a, a real inner, inner product space. We are considering C as an as a vector space over R. So when you look at the inner product of a, a mod of a plus b square, if you take, there will be mod a square plus mod b square plus inner product of a b plus inner product of b a. But remember that inner product of b a, which is the conjugate of the inner product of a b here, is equal to the inner product of a b because the conjugate uh, is equal to itself. It's a real inner product space. And you will get that two times the inner product of a b is equal to the is equal to two times the product of the norm of a and b. And now you use Cauchy Schwarz. When will there be an equality? It will be when one of them is a scalar multiple of the other. And that's precisely what is captured here. So we now have by now in an induction argument. I will leave that for you to complete. we have that C0 minus C1 is equal to lambda times C2 minus C1 times Z0. 
In fact, each of them you can write as a scalar multiple. And this is where lambda is some real number. But that implies that Z0 is equal to C0 minus C1 by lambda times C2 minus C1. Notice that lambda will not be 0. Because if lambda is 0, C0 minus C1 would be 0, thereby implying that C0 is equal to C1. So lambda can never be 0, nor will C2 minus C1 be by the very assumption. So this tells us that this is in real number. So let's go back about what happened. We have assumed that Z0, the absolute value of Z0 is less than or equal to 1. Then we have proved that Z0 should necessarily be a real number. But we are still not through. We have to show that, you know, there is some contradiction which might come up even now, which we have not, we have to show in fact, because it cannot have absolute value less than or equal to 1. That's what we have to prove, right? Okay, so what will we do next? Uh, notice that if z0 is greater than 0, then p of z0 is equal to c0 plus c1z0 plus something. And this is greater than or equal to c0 because whatever is captured inside this bracket is a positive number. And this will never be equal to 0. And therefore, hence z0 cannot be 0. Z0 cannot be a root. And what about if z0 is less than 0? Then let us divide the cases into 2. Uh, if n is odd, what do we have? n is odd, then p of z0 will be c0 minus c1 times, okay, let z0 be equal to say minus of uh, w, or minus of a. So, this is going to be c0 minus c1 a plus um, c2 a square. So, let me put an a square common here, which will be c2 minus C1A, okay, C3A, I am sorry. And N is odd tells us that final term will be of this type. A to the power N minus 1 into C N minus C N minus 1 minus C N times. So remember A is a positive, where A is a positive number. And each of these terms which I am putting in bracket now or rather I am underlining now, they are all positive. Because C0 minus C1 times A, A is less than 1, remember that and C1 is less than C0. So this is going to be less than or equal to or rather this will be greater than or this will be strictly greater than 0, this will be strictly greater than 0, this will be strictly greater than 0. All these terms will be greater than 0 which would imply that p of z0 is greater than 0. It cannot be a root. And what happens if n is even? If n is even, then p of z0, again we will do the same clubbing, it will be c0 minus c1a plus a square times c2 minus c3a plus a to the power n minus 2 into c n minus 2 minus c n minus 1 times a and there will be finally one extra term which is the last term a to the power n times c n. It's technically minus a to the power n times c n but I am I'm taking care of the minus a's powers in this manner. You should check that this has been taken care of in, in, in a correct manner. This is also again same argument tells us that this is all greater than 0. This is also greater than 0, which implies that P of Z0 cannot be 0. And therefore, we have now come to a contradiction. If mod Z0 is less than 0, P of Z0, we have not come to a contradiction, we have just shown that P of Z0 cannot be 0 if mod Z0 is less than 0. If mod Z0 is less than 0, we first showed that Z0 should be real. And if Z0 is real, it cannot be a root of absolute value less than 1. So hence, we have proved
that mod z0 is less than or equal to 1 implies p of z0 is not equal to 0. Okay, that completes the problem. The next problem involves the absolute value of the complex numbers. It is about uh, how we can manipulate them to uh, get, what, get what we want. So, let me write it down the problem. Let z and w be complex numbers such that 1 plus mod z square times w is equal to mod and I said mod I mean the absolute value modulus that is another word which is generally used 1 plus absolute value of w square times z this is equal suppose z and w are two complex numbers which satisfy this then either z is equal to w or z w bar is equal to 1. Let us give a quick proof of this statement. What does that uh, inequality here tell us? It tells us that 1 plus absolute value of z square times w is equal to 1 plus the absolute value of w square times z. Recall that the uh, product, uh, the square of the absolute value is the norm of z, which is basically z times z bar. So, rewriting this, this is i e 1 plus z z bar times w is equal to uh, 1 plus w w bar times z. Let us just rewrite it. Uh, this just uh, can be rewritten as, oh, I made a mistake. This will be outside. Maybe I should uh, write it here like this. W times this is Z times this. Okay, so W times 1 minus bring this to the left, this is going to be 1 minus w bar z is equal to z times 1 minus z bar w. If z is equal to 0, then what do we have? Then we have this would imply that w is also equal to 0 and hence we have z is equal to w and we are done. So, if one of them is 0, we are through. We have that the other one is also 0 and hence they are equal. Suppose z is not equal to 0 and if z bar w is not equal to 1. If z bar w is equal to 1, again that was one of the statements which we had to prove, right? Either Oh, z bar w or z w bar. If z bar w is equal to 1, its its conjugate which is z w, z bar w will also be equal to 1. So, this is equivalently, okay. This last part is equivalently z bar w is equal to 1. So, if z bar w is not, if it is equal to 1, again we are done. If it is not equal to 1, let us see what happens. Then, in fact, uh, let us prove exactly what is needed. If z w bar is not equal to 1, then w by z is equal to 1 minus z bar w by 1 minus w bar z. This makes sense because z is not 0 and z w bar is not equal to 1 and therefore this makes complete sense. And if we take the absolute value now, it will be the same and this is going to be 1 minus z bar w the absolute value of this divided by the absolute value of 1 minus let me write it as z w bar. But uh, if the complex number 1 minus z bar w is what is say let us call it zeta then in the denominator it is 1 minus z w bar it is basically zeta bar. So, this is just going to be equal to 1 because the 
denominator is the conjugate of the numerator and the absolute value of the conjugate of a complex number is the same as the absolute value of the number. So this is equal to 1 which implies that the absolute value of w is the same as the absolute value of z and therefore its square will also be the same and therefore 1 plus absolute value of this is equal to the one absolute value of z square plus 1 and if we multiply it by this is this is something which we have hence 1 plus absolute value of w square times z is equal to 1 plus absolute value of z square times w implies z is equal to w and we are done. The next problem deals with uh, the notion of connectedness. We gave a characterization of connected open sets in the complex plane. We proved that uh, an open set in the complex plane is connected if and only if any two points in the open set can be connected by a path. In this problem, we will specialize the result. We will, we will show that we can actually uh, get hold of some very special paths to join any two points. We will in fact show that we can uh, get hold of a polygonal path, which I will define in a moment, such that the, the line segments involved in the polygonal path will be parallel to the axis, the real axis or the imaginary axis. So let me first define what a polygonal path is. Uh, a path gamma from z to w is a polygonal path if it is obtained by concatenating finitely many straight lines. If there exists z1 to uh, z z0 okay. if there exists z0 equal to z from uh, z1 up to zn uh, zn minus 1 and zn equal to w such that again points in c in c such that gamma is obtained by let me write it like this gamma z0 z1 concatenated with gamma z1 z2 concatenated with all this and finally gamma zn minus 1 zn basically gamma z oh where where gamma zi zi plus 1 is the straight line path which joins z i and z i plus 1. So, this is going to be 1 minus s times z i plus s times z i plus 1. Notice that this is a straight line which connects z i plus 1 to z i or rather z i to z i plus 1. So, if we can get hold of finitely many paths which, so this is uh, in, in figures, it will be like this. Suppose we have two points, suppose we can go like this all these are straight lines that I am trying to draw even if it might not look like that. This is a straight line, this is a straight line, this is a straight line, a straight line and a straight line. So, this is our z0 which is z, this is our w, this is our z1, z2, z3, z4. So, in figures it will be like this. This is how a polygonal path will look like. The next problem tells us that if you have a connected set, and if you take any two points in the connected set, we can get hold of a polygonal path in the open set such that each of the line segments are parallel either to the x axis or the y axis, the real axis or the imaginary axis. That is a special type of path we can always get in connected open sets. Let me write down the problem. Let omega contained in C be a connected open set. Then prove that, so as I was mentioning connected open sets are special for our purposes. 
we can prove that given this is actually an if and only statement because the moment we have a, a polygonal path any type of uh, uh, polygonal path it's going to be a path and we have shown that if there are if the, if the given domain satisfies the condition that any two points can be connected by a path then it should be connected so this is actually an if and only statement but the forward is what uh, needs some work so let me just forward direction is what needs some work so let's prove that uh, given z comma w in omega there exists a polygonal path from z to w consisting of straight lines parallel to the axis to the real or imaginary axis. Let us give a proof of this. Let us do one thing. Let us first show that in a disk we can always do this. So, suppose Z0 is a point in C and R be greater than 0. Then we shall first prove that the disk of radius r around z naught satisfies this condition, satisfies the above condition. Let me first give you a, a picture which describes what I am going to do. In fact, I will not write down the explicit details which I will leave for you. If this is our complex plane and if this is our point z naught suppose we not let's put it a little this way so that we can draw a big disk suppose this is a disk of radius r around z naught this is our z naught and this is say z i will just prove that we can connect z to z naught by such a path that is enough because we could have taken two points and shown that the property is directly satisfied, but it is not going to be any different. If we show that uh, we can join z to z naught by such a path, because then we can concatenate the path from z naught to w, which is given similarly, and we will then get a path from z to w for some other arbitrary point w. So, if we can get hold of a path like this, which is parallel to the real axis and the imaginary axis and suppose we have a path like this by going along this path first and then going along the second path we get a path from z to w right but let us not uh, do it that way let us just prove that there is a path from z not to z and I will just notice the following if z not is equal to a not plus b not i so this is basically the vector a naught comma b naught and this is just the vector a comma b and z is equal to a plus b i let z prime be this point in fact i will not make any complicated path it's going to be the most straightforward path we can get here and then going this way or oh, rather from z naught to z if it is like that it will go from a naught comma b naught to if this is a comma b this will go to a comma b so let z prime be the point a comma b naught rather this is the x axis so a will be the same and this is the y axis so it will be a comma b naught so let z prime be the point a plus b naught i then gamma z naught z prime which is given by 1 minus gamma of s given by 1 minus s times z naught plus s times z prime this is a straight line path 
from z0 to z prime and by definition this is going to be parallel to the real axis and gamma z prime z0 of s which is given by 1 minus s times z prime plus s times z is a path which is this is parallel to real axis and this is parallel to the imaginary axis define gamma to be obtained by concatenating this so i'll slowly start giving you the description of this path you could do this inductively that's what the theorem for finitely many paths and that's precisely what was demanded in the theorem right so we can do this from 0 to half this will go at twice the speed it will be gamma z0 z prime of 2s and from half to 1 it will be gamma z prime z0 of 2s minus that's precisely what, what the path gamma does and gamma has segments which are parallel to the real axis and hence we always can find hence the property is satisfied so how did i put it here yes hence the disk dz0r satisfies the conditions satisfies the problem conditions are the hypothesis of the the conclusion of the problem from here it's the straightforward uh, mimicking of the proof we gave for uh, the equivalence of connectedness and their existing a path between two points. So, define A to be all those points Z in omega such that Z can be joined to Z naught by a polygonal path parallel to the axis. I will leave it as an exercise here because we have already done this argument once. Prove that A is both open and closed. By using the fact that disk, we just check that disk, we can do that. And by concatenating the path inside the disk, we will be able to show that it is open and we will show that we will be able to show that its complement is close uh, is open in a similar manner a complement will be open by showing that every point will be an interior point and with this we will show that because z0 since z0 itself is a point in a so we have fixed a z0 in omega before we started defining a and because z0 is a point in a we have a is equal to omega we are done So connectedness is actually kind of nice. We have some really nice paths which can be used to connect any two points in our given domain. The next problem uh, deals with uh, uh, when a continuous map turns out to be a closed map. So again, one definition before we go into the next problem. These are some topological notions which, which are useful. A function f from x to y is between metric spaces. So I'm always in the world of metric spaces, is said to be a closed map if f of c is closed in y whenever c is closed in x okay it takes closed sets to closed sets image of a closed set is closed that's that's, that's not necessarily uh, the case in a, con a continuous mapping you should always remember that but if this does happen then it's called a closed map the problem asks us to prove that whenever we have a continuous mapping from a compact metric space to another compact 
another metric space, then it should necessarily be a closed mapping. So let f from x to y be a continuous mapping from a compact metric space to another metric space. Then F is a closed mapping. Okay, let us do that. Proof. Let us start with a closed subset. Let F contained in X be a closed set. We would like to show that maybe E is better. F of E is a closed set in Y. That is what we would like to show. Suppose E contained in X is a closed set. What do we know about closed subsets of a compact metric space? Since X is compact, a closed subset of a compact metric space is also compact. And now uh, a claim which maybe I should leave as an exercise. A continuous mapping always takes compact sets to compact sets. F of E is compact. Well, it is not difficult to check this. I will leave it as an exercise by giving you an idea. Take any open cover of F of E. When you look at the, let me write it down. Let uh, U uh, B, let U consisting of u alpha be an open cover of f of e. Remember that u alpha are all open sets in capital Y. Okay. Then define let us say v to be a collection of f inverse of u alpha, where alpha is again running over the same indexing set. And notice that this is uh, an open cover of E, but we know that E is compact. There exist finitely many uh, elements in the in the cover, which will in the cover whose union will contain E, and the corresponding U alpha i's will have the same property. So I'll just leave it as an excess to complete the proof. Complete the proof of claim. From here. After this observation, it is quite straightforward to see that there will be a finite subpower of U as well. So, the image of a compact set will always be a compact set. Now, what do we know? Uh, hence, f of E is a compact subset of Y. But we know that compact subsets of a metric space are closed. We proved that and hence closed. Therefore, f is a closed mapping and that completes the proof. Let us conclude this problem session by solving a very popular theorem which is called the hein borel theorem. So, even though it is a popular theorem, we are going to realize it as a nice corollary to the things we have developed so far. So, let me just write it down for you, Hein Borel theorem. It gives a characterization of uh, compact sets in RF. So, the theorem says the following a subset K contained in Rn is compact if and only if K is closed and bounded in Rn. We did not uh, explicitly say what the metric is, but it the it is the standard metric that, that we will be working with. So, so let us prove this result. It is now actually quite straightforward for us. We have done all the preliminary work to 
prove this particular theorem. The forward direction is actually quite easy. Uh, let it be compact. And we have already seen that compact subsets of a metric space will turn out to be uh, closed. And this gives, and hence, then k is compact. Uh, then k is closed by one of the theorems we have proved. Now let us consider the open cover which is given by all balls of radius n around 0. Notice that if you look at the union of uh, these balls, it is going to be the entire space Rn and hence u is an open cover of k as well. But k is compact, right? Since k is compact, u, uh, k has an, uh, there exists, where is this happening? There exists in such that k is contained in b01 union up to b0n which is equal to b0n itself and this precisely it is a reformulation of uh, demanding that k is, com uh, k is bounded and k is bounded. So, if you notice we very quickly proved that uh, compactness immediately tells us whether it is closed, uh, that it is closed and that it is bounded. <clears throat> now, notice that we did not use any specific property of Rn here, we have just used the fact that there is a metric and that for 0 was no special, you could have taken any reference point and we, we would have still got this, right. It is in the converse part, so we have shown both, right, yes, we have shown, we have observed that it is closed immediately by one of the theorems we did earlier or propositions we did earlier and this simple observation tells us that it is bounded. Now, let us assume that k is both bounded and uh, <clears throat> closed. Assume that k is closed and bounded. The fact that k is bounded tells us that we can think of k is a subset of one such ball, but rather than ball, let me take something else. k is contained in a1, b1 cross a n, b n. This is a closed set, k is a closed subset of Rn and this in particular is also a closed subset of Rn. What we will do is we will show that this kind of sets are always compact. If we show that this is a compact set, then k is a closed subset of a compact set and hence it will be a compact set and we will be done, right. But showing that this is a compact set uh, has already been done in a course on real analysis for you, it is what is popularly called as the Bosanovay stress theorem. Uh, I will just show that, um, well, I will just show that this particular set is a sequentially compact set. So, in fact, I will just show that A, B, is sequentially compact. We have all done all the hard work to establish that the notion of compactness is equivalent to the notion of sequentially compactness in Rn. So, this is sequentially compact is something which we will show. In fact, let us first show this and then we will show that uh, the product of the intervals which will be a subset in Rn will be sequentially compact. Okay, let us consider, in fact, we will, uh, okay, let us do this, let us do this. Okay, let x n be a uh, sequence. 
in R in AB. The first thing to note is that AB is bounded and therefore we can talk about then there exists a, a subsequence converging to the limbs of the supremum converging to the supremum of A where A is the set consisting of all elements in the sequence. I will assume this from your real analysis course. Now and that tells us that A B is sequentially compact right. The moment we have any sequence we have a subsequence which is converging to the supremum and therefore we have a convergent subsequence therefore the interval A B is sequentially compact. The next claim so this completes the claim of this proof another claim now is that A B cross C D is sequentially compact and I will leave it there after uh, to establish for you uh, that uh, in Rn it will be the case. This is going to establish establish the result for R2. I will maybe bother about Rn, let you bother about Rn. And for, for doing that, uh, let Xn, Yn be a sequence. Oh yes, one, one observation was pending here. We did have a sequence converging to the supremum, let us call that supremum alpha, but the question always remained as to why alpha would belong to AB. The reason is because AB is a closed set, therefore the, the limit also belongs to our given set and that, that is the reason why we have a conversion subsequence. If it was open AB and uh, we were looking at the uh, subsequence which converges to say B, if suppose the sequence Xn had its supremum equal to B and we had a subsequence converging to B, it would not have been of any use because B does not belong to our given set, right. Here the key factor is that it is closed, the supremum belongs to this closed set and that is why it is a sequentially compact set. Now we will show that this is also sequentially compact, how do we go about doing that? Let Xn1 be a sequence be a convergent subsequence of Xn. Of just the first coordinator Xn. Remember that these Xn's belong to closed AB, and therefore we have a convergent subsequence. Now define uh, a new sequence. Let's call it Zn to be Zk to be equal to x n k y n k or maybe not let me not bring in unnecessary notations let me just say that now you consider a new sequence consider the sequence the sequence y n k in c d we are remember that it is with k the indexing now we have just shown that c d is sequentially compact so now there x is a further subsequence which converges in c d and remember that uh, this is a the n k's are obtained by considering a subsequence of x n therefore whatever subsequence you take further that will again converge to uh, the limit of x n k itself by going to a further subsequence y n uh, m l or rather k l by going to a further convergent subsequence of y and k let me not li make life complicated let me just say this we obtain a subsequence i think we will have to write it down given by let's write it down given by y and k 
consider the subsequence xn kl yn kl and prove that that this is converging to the uh, limit of x n k l and the limit of y n k l which in particular belongs to a b cross c d and therefore we have just shown that a b cross c d is sequentially compact that was the second claim inductively you can you could argue or you could yeah the, by an inductive argument you could show that in r n if you look at the product of such intervals they will be sequentially compact and in a metric space sequential compactness is equivalent to compactness by induction hence we have a1 b1 cross a n b n is compact and we are done because a closed subset of a compact set will be a compact set and therefore k will be compact.